say thank you uh, to uh, NAS for laying on these talks while we're all living in this uh, bizarre lockdown world. Um, and uh, thanks for having me along. So uh, today's talk is uh, about the uh, new boat wrecks of the First World War. Um, this is a, a subject that's close to my heart of um, all the work that I've uh, carried out um, looking at shipwrecks over the years. Um, this is the uh, one subject area which I'm uh, I'm continually drawn to and um, is, find it very rich, very rewarding. And there's uh, a lot of really good material um, within it that uh, uh, is, is going to keep me gamely occupied for a long time. And But I've looked at the U-boat uh, wrecks in the English Channel now and I've uh, come up with some uh, quite an interesting data set, which uh, I'm going to share with you today. Um, just to uh, give you a little bit of background for those who are not familiar with it, the uh, first U-boat war uh really got underway um at its absolute height in uh, in uh, 1917 when there was a uh, unrestricted attack on uh, on shipping that that lasted throughout the last um two years of the war and um during this time uh the britain uh, suffered um grievously in the losses of ships in fact in april one in that month alone 425 merchant ships were sunk and despite the introduction of um, convoy and a number of other things, the losses remained at over 100 a month until the end of the war. And if you look at the uh, picture on the left, this is a, a German uh, propaganda poster, but it gives a good impression of uh, the way this played out. And um, for the waters of Great Britain and for Ireland and for France, we uh, uniquely uh, have this, um, th this legacy from the first war. And if you put it just around Britain, for instance, if you take away... Uh, ships that were stranded. So you look at particularly at offshore wrecks, say wrecks from um, 20 meters depth outwards, um, then over 40% of all of those shipwrecks around Britain were sunk by U-boats in the First World War. When you add in what was what came in World War II, then around about 60% of our underwater cultural heritage offshore in Britain um, comes from the comes from the two World Wars. So it's a, a significant and important part of our past. And of course, within all the steamships and the rest. Are in fact the U-boats themselves, which were the um, were the subject of a lengthy um, study I carried out over a period of 17 years. And to put that in context today, I thought what I'd do um, is to look at how the archaeological record compares to um, the assertions made by a couple of uh, our most famous uh, uh, naval historians of the 20th century. Uh, on the left is Arthur Marder, and Marder, Marder made some very trenchant criticisms about the naval staff and about the competence of a lot of the officers that were in the naval staff that were trying to assess what the uh, what the U-boats are doing, where they were, and in fact, even when they were being sunk. And you can see he you know, decided they were merely a nondescript collection of officers, many of them as ignorant of the principles of staff work as they are of strategy and operations. Uh, controversial stuff today, although it must be said in 1970, nobody really seemed to notice. Um, on the uh, right by the mains, we have uh, Stephen Roskill, uh, a Navy man through and through, came up through the gunnery school, served on HMS War Spy, was de facto in many ways official naval historian writing the uh, War at Sea and the rest. But in 1959, he wrote a very, very strongly worded criticism of the Royal Navy and particularly aspects of the, uh, the Navy in the way that it insisted on a land campaign in Flanders in 1917, which led to the uh, horrific Battle of Passchendaele. Um, that campaign, you, you will remember, was um, was was aimed at trying to drive a U-boat base out of um, of Zeebrugge and Bruges um, because it was seen as a threat. And Roskill's view was that this was a monumental folly. Now, it's quite interesting. As this talk goes on, um, you'll see that one of these people was generally correct in the assertions that they made, and the other, in fact, was completely wrong. This is not a direct criticism of either historian. I'm just looking specifically at the points that they made in these in these in those in those two uh, publications. Now. The archaeological record for uh, U-boat wrecks around the UK is pretty good. Uh, we have uh, the hydrographic uh, um, database. Um, the waters around the UK are extremely well surveyed. And in fact, um, in the, the years that uh, I've been looking at U-boat wrecks, very, very few new ones um, have showed up. And certainly there's been no surprises in the last five or six years. So we have a pretty good hard and fast idea of where they all are. And you can go around and dive them. Uh, World War One U-boats can be identified um, in a number of different ways. But uh, one way you can do it is actually to take the U-boat number um, off the propeller. You can do that in situ, as you'll see in a moment. 
Um, the document on the left uh, is in the National Archives, and it's uh, the anti-submarine division of uh, the Navy Intelligence Division of the Royal Navy's final assessment of where it believed in 1919 the 178 U-boats sunk in World War One were destroyed. So we have that, and we have a hydrographic record, and we can do the diving, come up with an archaeological record and compare the two together. Now, I've got a little video clip coming up next. Unfortunately, the sound won't play within the webinar software, so I'm going to talk you through it. But it, it'll just, uh, it just shows a little bit about how the, uh, how the process of carrying out the identifications um, took place. Um, this was um, done for a, a television series called Red Detectives. Um, and in this case, we're off um, Padstow on the um, North Cornish coast. Uh, back in um, 2003, you'll see a rather youthful Innis sitting there. And um, this uh, this program was aimed at um, identifying a, a, a U-boat, a First War era U-boat that was found off Padstow in a hydrographic survey uh, in 2001. And what was quite interesting about this is that according to the 1919 list that you've seen, uh, there were uh, no World War One era u-boats recorded lost in this area in fact there are none for um you know for, for maybe 100 miles or more uh certainly going uh, going north and so th it proved to be a mystery i dived it a couple of times then we got involved in in making this tv program and the idea was um to go to go down there there's um, miranda krestovnikov uh, in front of me and to see if we could actually um uh, identify it uh, in, in real time uh, the wreck was uh, 60 odd meters down, um, so it was a, a deep trimix dive. Um, uh, but the, to, it was um, it was it was successfully identified through the uh, propeller method, which you'll see. Uh, I had a little camera with me, uh, which I took off down to um, the stern and started working away uh, on the on the propellers. Obviously, the marine growth has to be removed. And uh, sometimes there's some crud uh, there as well that just needs to be uh, needs to be bashed off. And then in there, there's actually a, a stamp put on the propellers by the shipyard. And um, I was able to um, to identify the numbers and the little camera there. And uh, I had there was actually a hydrophone in the water, so um, the guys up on the boat could actually guide me uh, to uh, to where I needed to go to. Um, to get the information that they needed. So I could hear them talking to me. I couldn't actually speak back because we weren't on comms, but it didn't take that long to do it. I think in about 15 minutes, we'd done one prop and then the other one was even easier. It didn't take too long. Um, and um, we managed to uh, identify the um, the U-boat as um, as UB-65. And, uh, and they're all getting very excited up there in the control box now as the, uh, as the number comes into view. So that's how you do it. When you get difficult cases, cases which don't seem to uh, match with the 1919 list at all, there is a means by which um, these U-boats can be identified. And um, we did a number of these over the years, um, and uh, they always they always seem to be a, um, a reliable means of, of doing this. So where this gets us uh, is if you look at the uh, the U-boats uh, um, in the English Channel. Um, you end up in a situation where, although the 1919 list said there were like 37, there are in fact, uh, uh, counting for two that were salvaged, 35. And there are 11 of those are actually mystery sites. So if you look at the uh, map on the left, um, on the bottom one, you can see UB65 there off the uh, North Cornish coast. You can see where the other ones are. Um, so the mystery sites are mixed in there. And avoiding double counting, um, you actually end up with uh, uh, an assessment of, uh, of the 1919 list that is actually only 48% correct, which is quite interesting. When I was at school, 48% was fail. Um, and, you know, the assessment, the value has to be made is why did the uh, anti-submarine division in World War I uh, get, these, get so many of the assessments that they made about the U-boats being sunk wrong? Um, you know, it's important to remember that uh, these engagements were nearly all on the surface. There were depth charges, but there was no sonar. So they, they, these submarines didn't just simply were attacked underwater without evidence. Um, a lot of them did end up in minefields, but the assessment criteria itself was, um, was, wasn't was was flawed. It was perhaps the way it was being managed that was. So there are a couple of things that, come, that came out of that. Um, so looking at the Marder critique, it's quite interesting. You know, he says there was there were no proper naval staff, that the, the people that were doing the assessments job actually weren't following their own rules. 
Uh, and in fact, this is this is what we find. Now we know where the U-boats are. Now we know what they what they what the names of them are. It's possible to um, look back at the 1919 list and, and see it in a different way. And um, to do this, the first thing to do was to actually look at what the anti-submarine division was actually supposed to be doing. And conveniently, it published a a history of its of its work after the war, which which survives. And in it, it actually um, sets out the uh, its assessment criteria for where it thinks the U-boats were destroyed. And it's interesting to note this assessment criteria was used uh, right through World War II as well um, and didn't change very much. So if you had a case where a U-boat was known, absolutely 100 percent known to be destroyed, they were considered A grade cases and then B grade was possible or anything else. So um, using that criteria against um, the list of where the U-boats are, um, it was actually quite revealing because what it showed was that 27%, um, oh, well over a quarter of the cases that were assessed by the anti-submarine division that were not actually done following their own procedures, um, the, the assessments and they made, well, they made were arbitrary and not based on um, the, even the evidence that they were supposed to be using. So Marder's idea that um, the officers that are in there were not working to process because they'd never been trained to do so and took it upon themselves to make decisions um, based on um, less evidence than they should have used, um, seems to hold a, um, a, a good deal of water. So uh, that accounts for, um, for for some of the mistakes. There are other issues that in a short session like this, I can't, I can't go into, but that's certainly one of them. So I find that Marder's um, critique is um, compelling in that regard. An example would be, uh, say, UB-78. You can see uh, this wreck is actually in the Dover minefield. Uh, and was identified uh, by the propeller markings that you, you can see in the picture. But in the 1919 list, uh, it's listed as being rammed and sunk off Cherbourg um, and a, in a known sunk sinking. Um, and there was no uh, evidence for this at all, apart from a patch of oil, no physical evidence. And that attribution simply should not have been made. And whoever made it wasn't following the rules. So that's just one example of, of the ones that are there. Now, we'll have a look at another one. And then the next example is even perhaps more interesting. And this is uh, one of the U-boat uh, wrecks that is in Dover. Uh, during the First World War, there was a, a minefield um, laid between um, Dover and, well, between Folkestone and Grenay. Um, and it was built out so that by 1918, it um, was um, it become extremely efficient at, um, at sinking U-boats. And in fact, you look, you can see it here. The, the lines you see are actually all the lines of mines in the minefield as it was um, finally built out. These are all uh, laid in uh, GIS, along with the recorded incidences from um, from the various records around and the positions of the uh, the U-boats that uh, that are known to be there, along with the identities that we've we've been able to give to them. And it's interesting to note that um, with the build out of the minefield, there was also a specialist diving unit. Um, that came came into service in uh, 1917 uh, that has been um, called the uh, tin openers. Uh, their job was to go to uh, sunken U-boats and attempt to retrieve intelligence material from inside them. So um, maps, uh, charts, uh, coding information and, and so on. And one of the areas they were very active was Dover uh, because there's a lot of patrolling there and oil patches could be seen. The wrecks themselves were relatively shallow. Um, so Demand's team looked at a number of the wrecks in the Dover area. Uh, one of the ones they looked at uh, was, a, was a mine layer, UC2 class mine layer um, that we now know is um, UC79. It was originally uh, located by uh, Alain Ricard, French diver. He, this is his sketch here, I thought, annotated it with some photographs from our dives on the wreck in 2014. And the wreck was identified um, in part at the time because one of the propellers was marked with UC79. And it turns out that this wreck um, is, uh, is UC-79 for reasons that I'll describe. On the right-hand side, you can actually see Damant's original telegram, uh, which he sent up to the Admiralty after the day's diving that's on there. Um, and the, the position and the description of the wreck match exactly what's there. And in fact, when you flip on the chart, you can see uh, the dive site uh, position given from 1918 um, by, by, by range and bearing from land. You can see the position where the wreck actually is and the oil patch uh, that was reported in June 1918, which um, which Demant would have used to um, to guide him to that wreck. So um, this U-boat shows up, uh, information goes up to the Admiralty, who are then interested in knowing what it is. 
And in this particular case, uh, a piece of metal was um, recovered uh, from the from the bridge of the submarine, which you can see in the photograph here on the left, on which there is a large barnacle. Uh, and in an attempt to date when this submarine was lost, this uh, barnacle and the piece of metal was sent to the Natural History Museum in London, uh, so that it could be established when it actually started to grow. And it was worked out that um, that that, that uh, the U-boat must have been sunk in the uh, spring of uh, of 1918. Um, and what was quite interesting about that was then the only mine layer loss at that time was UC-79. So it was known to the Admiralty in 1918 that that wreck was probably UC-79. And that was being confirmed now um, by the archaeology. But the most interesting aspect of this, of course, is the fact that it is entirely absent from the 1919 list, even though uh, the, uh, uh, the true fate of this U-boat was clearly known to the anti-submarine division. And there's a reason for this. Um, and that is that uh, anti-submarine decision had already, in its wisdom, concluded that UC-79 had been sunk. In fact, they attributed the destruction of UC-79 to an attack by a British submarine, HMS E-45, in the Southern North Sea in October 1917. Um, again, the only evidence was a great disturbance of water. And so the uh, attribution, uh, the assessment was made not on the, um, not on the type of evidence that's needed for an A-grade sinking at all, an entirely arbitrary decision without the evidential basis. So it's hardly surprising that it was going to be overturned. But what is surprising in this case, it was actually overturned by evidence during wartime. And you can go in the National Archives and um, look in the record for UC-79. And there is a note from the tracking room saying this U-boat is still operational. Um, but uh, the fact that it was was simply ignored by anti-submarine division who, who, who maintained um, that the UC-79 had been lost in, in this uh, uh, to this incident that you see here, even though it was... Um, clearly not the case. Now, that in itself is quite interesting. But um, what the, the, the clinching piece of evidence that showed that this was going on, and this is not an isolated event, um, came from reading the uh, unpublished autobiography of uh, a chap called uh, William F. Clark. Clark was a naval intelligence officer throughout World War I, through the interwar years, and in World War II became the um, deputy director of the uh, of the U-boat section at Bletchley Park. So he, he, he probably, in many ways, um, one of Britain's, um, uh, historically, one of Britain's most important intelligence officers in both world wars. His uh, autobiography, as I said, uh, unpublished, is highly critical in places of, uh, of what he saw during his career. And uh, one of the things that you'll see there noticed in white is that um, the anti-submarine division were um, to boost their own efforts, insisting on attacks that uh, the intelligence officers in room 40 knew to be wrong. Um, and they, they were simply doing this to, to hide the fact that they were, were struggling, I think, to uh, to actually really know what was going on with the U-boats. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise to us that we see things like this. And in fact, uh, this propagandizing of U-boat losses continued into 1940 uh, until um, until Churchill's departure from the Admiralty, after which time uh, uh, more more sensible than evidence based um, staff work came came into uh, came into being. So that's uh, that's the naval staff. Uh, it was struggling, and it wasn't wasn't following its own processes, leading to inaccuracies in the record. But the record is inaccurate for lots of other reasons too. And the second part of this talk really needs to uh, address the second one, and and this is to do with uh, uh, this is to do with uh, other aspects to intelligence, and it's seen best through uh, uh, Roskill's very very strongly worded critique of the Royal Navy. I said in this. Um, article in the Royal United Services Institute Journal in 1959. Uh, the Royal Navy pushed for a, a, a land campaign in Flanders in 1917 that led to Passchendaele. And uh, Roskill's view was that this was uh, this, this was just completely wrong. And uh, at any other time, uh, more sober heads would have prevailed and no such thing would have happened. I mean, the, what some of the things that he pointed out, for instance, were uh, that if Flanders had been overrun, wouldn't the U-boats just move to Germany and continue prosecuting the war in exactly the same way. So what would have been the benefit um, that the Flanders boats only ever accounted for a third of the losses and that the convoy system would have saved Britain? Um, uh, all of these, in fact, are, are completely fallacious. Uh, but to, to look at them individually, if you, the, the issue about uh, uh, the U-boats returning to Germany um, and would have continued the war is, extent, is to one extent absolutely right, but this is exactly what the Admiralty wanted. They wanted the U-boats out of Flanders, um, for reasons I'll mention in a moment. Um, 
his accounting when it says uh, that Flanders boats every account referred to the losses is uh, completely uh, fake. In fact, uh, the statistics that would have been available for Ross Galilli used them properly um, would have realized that in fact Flanders was sinking about half the boats and in some areas even more than that. They were very dangerous. Roscoe just con conveniently forgot to account for the uh, the mine laying U boats that were running out of Flanders that uh, made up a lot of the difference. And it was the mine layers um, that made uh, the, even the institution of the convoy system in the English Channel uh, uh, not that successful because you know co you know convoys and ships will sail over mines. So there was the mine laying was accounting for ships even after the controlled sailings had been brought in. And the primary reason for why the Flanders Fertilla was so dangerous um, was the fact that it, when it was set up in 1915 uh, by the officer uh, Bartenbach, you see a picture of here on the on the right, it instituted a, a policy of non-radio use. Uh, it was set up uh, on on foreign soil, and that the policy of non-radio use was not to, in any way to befuddle the Admiralty, but was to uh, try to um, keep the movements of the U-boats um, in and out of Bruges and, and uh, along the canal of Adler Zeebrugge away from uh, uh, spies and the rest to try and keep them operating um, secretly. And it was this aspect of um, the Flanders Fertilla's uh, operations that proved such a challenge. And in fact, um, if Roskill had done his work properly before he, he, he uh, wrote this uh, particular article, uh, one of the things you may have come across, and it certainly uh, wasn't available to anybody else at the time, but uh, but existed uh, in uh, in the Naval Historical Branch at, at that point, having been written in 1922, um, was the the Room 40 appreciation of uh, the German naval's uh, German Navy's performance um, in the First World War, and this is a, a remarkable document, um, and in it uh, quite clearly. Uh, you see the comment here in somewhat marked contrast to the custom of the North Sea bases, German authorities of considerable secrecy as to naval movements on the Flanders coast. In particular, the greatest restrictions in the use of wireless were enforced. The Flanders boats when received were, con were consistently silent and unlike their comrades in the eight, in the bike flotillas and um, refrained from reporting their positions or the results of their cruises. Now, this has an absolutely fundamental uh, effect on um, the ability for the Navy to do anything to, to deal with the with the uh, Flanders U-boats. They would get through the minefield, they would appear in the channel without notice and start sinking ships. Um, conveniently, the U-boats uh, based in Germany were on the radio all the time. There were direction, sta uh, direction finding stations um, set up that could, uh, could, uh, could track their movements. You can move ships away. You can, uh, you can put, uh, put uh, escort vessels in their way and you can hinder them, make life difficult for them. With the Flanders boats, you simply couldn't do this at all. And one of the reasons why they were just so dangerous. Um, I'll give you an example of what happens when uh, U-boats were using the radio in 1918. Uh, one of the wrecks in the English Channel, uh, UB72, uh, which we, we surveyed in, um, in 2000. Uh, this particular U-boat uh, got on the radio um, in, uh, on the uh, 12th of May 1918. Uh, that uh, uh, radio signal was um, picked up by direction finding. There happened to be a British submarine on patrol in the area, and it was immediately vectored to the position where the U-boat was anticipated to be, and peremptorily torpedoed it, blowing it in half, which is which is how we found it in 2000. So, if there was radio intelligence, things could be done. When there wasn't radio intelligence, things could not be done. So, if the if during the course of the land campaign in 1917 the U-boats had been driven out of Flanders and had gone back to Germany, had then been following fleet rules, things would have got a lot easier for the Admiralty. And it's important to remember this. You know, there was a logic behind the Admiralty's insistence on a land campaign in Flanders that Stephen Roskill uh, had just just seems to have completely missed. And here we are. If you see it in stark numbers, uh, these are the uh, the, the U-boats uh, in the in the area where we studied, and the ones marked in red are the only ones where there was any radio intelligence. And in two of those cases, the U-boats were sunk uh, by British submarines, and one of them uh, ended up in the minefield. In all the other cases, the uh, there was no intelligence at all to help with um, with knowing where they were, and in some cases, even being able to ascertain how they were destroyed. So radio silence combined with uh, problems around being able to assess uh, where the U-boats are, are being destroyed and not working to, pro to process are the two great problems that, that, that appeared at this time and account for a large significance of the disparity between the 1919 list and the archaeological record. Put it in, in simplest terms, if you Bartenbach's decision um, uh, to to institute radio silence 
uh, in um, in in 1915, for the time that I was there, ended up not only causing the uh, the land campaign um, in Flanders in 1917 that, that that led to the Third Battle of Ypres, a, a Passchendaele, and a, the the loss of a quarter of a million British soldiers, but it, it also uh, led to the Zeebrugge raid uh, the following year, which was also a, a costly failure. And it's quite interesting. Bardenbach's decision was made purely to try and keep the movements of his U-boat secret. But in so doing, uh, what was actually a fairly small enterprise just drew in inordinately large amounts of, uh, of uh, enemy resources to try and to, to uh, try and eradicate it. And in those strategic terms, perhaps the Flanders flotilla was just as dangerous as it was in its uh, in its ability to seemingly um, sink ships with impunity. And the final point I'll say is that. Um, we looked at the uh, U-boat wrecks in the uh, the same area that was sunk in World War II. They're very they're comparable numbers, and uh, going through uh, similar methodologies, uh, identification is slightly more difficult with the Second World ones. Uh, but nonetheless, one of the things that that comes out is that when the U-boats are using the radio, which is what they're doing up to the end of 1944, the because of the Bletchley Park, the uh, radio signals can be decrypted. And uh, because the uh, Operation Intelligence Centre in London is um, operating to a process, uh, the, uh, the assessment of uh, U-boat losses is 82% correct during that time. And that's a combination of working to process and having good signals intelligence. But interestingly, in 1945, when the, the U-boats start uh, operating in what was known as the inshore campaign around Britain, they're not using the radio, or hardly ever. And in so doing, Bletchley Park won't do anything. It's, it's of no use at all. The enemy won't cooperate by by communi communicating on the airwaves. And so the accuracy rate for uh, for uh, for 1945 falls to 36 percent. So it's even lower than it was during the um, First World War. And that's really good staff work. And I think it shows more than anything else that it signals intelligence um, in both the First and the Second World War that was so fundamentally important to be able to counter the threat of the U-boat. So that's my uh, that's nearly everything I have to say uh, on this uh, this short presentation. If you want further information, there's some references for you there at the bottom. Um, don't forget also you can look on my YouTube channel where there's a, a video material relating to a number of the U-boats I've talked about in this and from the Second World War and some uh, multi-beam and, and the rest. And also, if you go to my uh, staff profile at Bournemouth University, the uh, the relevant published material um, for this paper and others is uh, is available there for um, for download too so uh, thank you very much mm -hmm.